by Rio Grande. Welcome to police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 175 regarding a theater robbery. It was a million dollar theater. Check with the officers there. That's all. Roll and quit. this saying, if you make the finest mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. That's true about mousetrap, gasoline, or any other product. For two years, Rio Grande led all of the gasoline in percentage of sales increase. Thousands of well-informed motorists have literally beaten the path to the doors of Rio Grande dealers to get police car performance in their cars. Engineers, purchasing agents, police and fire departments, those who test gasoline, those to whom gasoline means most, have specified Rio Grande to crack gasoline in all their emergency equipment month after month. Listen to this list of new users just since the first of the year. Pasadena, Monterey Park, Maryville, Phoenix, Orange County, California, Coconina County, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada, and now Linwood, California, is the latest city to fly the Rio Grande banner and have true police car performance in her emergency equipment. Linwood is a thriving center of new and prosperous industry. Its 10,000 citizens take pride in their well-kept houses, schools, and law enforcement agencies. We have told you many times about Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties. Nothing can stop the march of progress of such a definitely superior product. The only gasoline in the West refined by the Sinclair cracking process. Accept no substitute for police car performance. Get the added mileage, quicker starting, increased power that Rio Grande cracked gasoline gives. Patronize your independent Rio Grande dealer from now on. Then Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Tonight you will hear a strange story of intrigue, petty jealousy, suspicious business partners, and to top it off, the old and well-known act, the double cross. When officers were first notified of this crime, they proceeded to investigate it in the usual way. But after a few hours of answers that made little if any sense, they were forced to rely on their own powers of deduction. Even then, they found themselves faced with one of those unusual situations where every time a lead started to develop into something, it suddenly and apparently with no reason at all came to an abrupt end. It is a story like this that illustrates so well the patience and vigilance of the modern police officer. He has a job to do, and until that job is much solved, his efforts never cease. He may put it aside for another case, but always, hidden away in some portion of his mind reserved for that, the driving thought remains, complete the case. Monday morning, March 14, 1932. Standing before the huge safe in his office, Manager George Evans pauses an instant in silent gloating at the thought of the sight that will greet his eyes in a moment. Inside the safe, more than $3,000 in bills and silver, the weekend receipts of his theater. Then, shaking off the momentary preoccupation, he kneels, consults a small slip of paper, begins twirling the glistening silver plated dial to its appointed mark. Left, then right, then left again. Suddenly, a small click of falling tumblers. A twist of the handle, and Manager Evans' face gleams with satisfaction as the door swings open. There. Now, this little door. And there it is. Oh. Why? Well, it... well, it's got to be. Good Lord. Coffin it. Coffin it. He knows the combination. He was here first this morning. 
Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes. Come in here. Come in here quickly, Sam. God ain't you, George. What's all the show? Sure. What's the matter with you? The safe. Look for yourself. The safe? Gone. Everything gone. Couldn't be. That's impossible. Impossible, is it? Well, look for yourself, Sam. First I lose money on investments. Then I lose money in the theater business. Now, now I lose money for my safe. How could it be, George? Only two people know the combination. Yes. You are one of them, Sam. You also. You should call the police. Yeah. They will want to know things, Sam. I want to know some things, too, George. Do call the police. Uh, all right. Hello? Get me the police, please. Yes, that's right. The police. I want to report a robbery. Yes, that's right. A robbery. <laughs> In response to the call, Captain Frank Katzenberger, in charge of the safe detail, accompanied by Detective Lieutenant George Chilton and T.A. Appledorn, cover the four blocks in as many minutes. Rushing upstairs to the manager's office, they find themselves practically having to battle their way in through a group of excited people buttering the small room. All right, all right, you people, take it easy. Come hey, you thought you think I done it? Left silly, but I'd be stealing from my I left last night before the money was put away, and I can prove it. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just get this story. Now quiet down. Now quiet down. Start with, I want to know who you people are. What's your name? I'm Herbert Laser. I got my ideas about this. All right, what are you doing out here? I'm a partner with Sam Carpenter, and we own the theater. I'm the one who lost the money. Would I be robbing myself? Well, it's been done. But wait a minute, who are these people? And who was the one that found the money gone? Uh, that one, George Evans. He's the manager of I the I can prove that I left before the money was put away. All right, which one put the money away? Uh, this fellow, John Walsh. He's the assistant manager. He handles the money. I don't know the combination of the safe. Evans opened it. I just put the money in and locked it. Mr. Early can vouch for me. All right, who's Mr. Early? He's the manager of the circle theater. This is him right here. Come on, go ahead. All right, now what were you doing here last night? I came in with the money from my theater. It was 11.30, but I didn't see the safe off. Some people were there waiting for me, and I, I went right out. And, yeah, and who are you? I'm Molly Lewis. I'm a cashier. All right, now everybody just sit down. I'll try to get some more dope on me. And remember, you're all under suspicion. I don't see why I'm under suspicion. Would I steal my own money? Maybe you know about it, Evan. Not me. I left at 10.30. That's before the money is even put in the safe. I wasn't near the place. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, we're not getting anywhere this way. Now, if someone will give me a nice, quiet story about how things work around here, maybe we can get something done. How about you, Evan? Sure, sure. Well, it's like this. The last show starts about 10-7. When it quiets down, the ticket seller leaves the box office and makes the money and the untold tickets upstairs. Then I open the safe and John Walsh here puts the money in and is supposed to lock it. Well, last night the same thing happened. I opened the safe about 10-15 and about 10-30 I... Well, I can prove I left then. Walsh can tell you that I left before the money was put away. Yeah, you could have come back after and opened the safe again. What? Don't try to be funny in a time like this. Yeah, you could have, couldn't you? Keep it calm, boys. Keep it calm. Now, when all this, who was the last one to actually see the money inside the thing? I, I guess I was. Joe Walsh? That's right. All right, let's hear your story. Well, after the last performance started, I went to the box office and got the money box, and, and Miss Loft and I took it up and counted it together. That took us about 15 minutes, and Miss Loft left right away. Then Evans came in and opened the safe. He's right when he says he left at 10.30. He did. And I was alone from then until about 11 o'clock. I was counting out $100 in change for the next day, and when I finished that... I put it in and locked the door in the inner safe. Inner safe? There are two of them? Yes, a big one and a smaller one inside. Did you know the combination of either one? No, no one did but Mr. Evans and Mr. Carpenter. All right, go on with your story. Yeah, go ahead. Tell us again about locking the safe. You're sure about that, are you? I'm absolutely certain that I locked the inner safe. All right, all right. Then what did you do? Well, at 11 o'clock, I went to check some of the earphones that we have for patrons or a heart of earphones that we have for patrons or a heart of earphones that we have for patrons or a heart of earphones. Who told you to check earphones? We got an outside serviceman who was supposed to do that. You had no right to roam around in the theater. Just a minute. I have a written order from the main office to investigate a complaint that the earphones were not working properly. I can produce that order if you'd like me to. I don't believe your story at all. All right, let him finish. Well, that's about all, officer. I left a little before midnight. All right, where did you go after you left the theater? Go straight home? Yes, I left my laundry at a little place around the corner, and then I took a streetcar home. You found a laundry open at midnight? No, the laundry wasn't open. I put it in the chute that they have. What kind of a container was your laundry in? What? Oh, <laughs> I see what you mean. You think I might have had the money wrapped in my laundry. Well, I, I had a shirt and three collars and a pasteboard box. That's all. 
I guess I'm in a bad spot, all right, but I'd like you to remember that I don't know the combination of the safe. Well, it was an inside job. That safe wasn't blown or jimmied. Someone unlocked it by using the combination. Evans and Kaufenick are the only ones who have the combination. Even if I knew it, I wouldn't rob my own safe. Perhaps you mean that I did it. I can account for every minute after I left it in. I didn't do it. You didn't do it. I think you should put somebody in jail and sweat the truth out of them. I have my idea. You needn't be afraid I'll run away. I'm as anxious as you are to get this matter cleared up. man is questioned thoroughly, but for no gain. The most intensive grilling fails to chase their clashing stories. Waltz repeats that Evans and Coffin Nick are the only ones who know the combination of the safe. Fazer advances the contention that Waltz failed to put the money in the safe at all. Evans simply states that he can prove that he left the theater before the money was put away. The men are released, and officers Captain Berger and Appledorn go farther afield in their quest for facts. The owner of the candy store tells of seeing Waltz acting suspiciously near the theater on the night of the robbery. The employees of the theater claim that Walsh is innocent. The fact that Evans and Kaufenick are losing money suggests the robbery might have been performed for the insurance that would be collected. Facts, suppositions, personal feelings all into the case. All lead nowhere. It develops into a hopeless tangle. The police are baffled because two people, unknown to them and forgotten by the suspects, Cultured the sea that finally developed into the drama enacted on the night of March 18th. The simple friendship of James Hill and Ruth Becker for Evans, the manager of the theater, sets the stage for the action. The two people are in Hill's apartment after being at the theater for the evening show. That's why I like it. It was sad the way they ended it, but, well, I don't know. It was right, I think. Yeah, it was good, all right. Say, why did you give me that funny look after the show when we were with Evans in the office? Mm, I don't know. I was just surprised at all the money he put in the safe, I guess. Is that all you were thinking about? No, sure, that's all. Why? I was just wondering. Did you notice the piece of paper he had? Yeah. yeah I noticed it all right. It was a combination, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a combination. I'd like to have a save with all that money in it, wouldn't you? Sure. I'd like to have a lot of money like that. Well. Hey, wait a minute. It'd be impossible to do anything like that. How could we? Oh, I guess it. Forget I said anything about it. Could be done, though. No. I'm sure of it. Time passes. The thought of the money in the safe grows in Hill's mind. And then one afternoon, the three are together in Hill's apartment. Evans is sitting on the couch, drowsy, after a lunch prepared by Ruth Becker, who is in the kitchen washing the few dishes used. Hill slouches in a chair looking out of a window. Signing again. Look after two. Sleepy? Yeah. And I have to be back in the theater about four. Uh, if I go to sleep, will you? Will you wake me? I can hardly keep myself awake. Sure. Go ahead. I'll wake you about 3.30. <laughs> I'm kind of sleepy myself. Well, don't forget to wake me up. Once more. No, it's all clear. What's the matter? Are you losing your nerve? 
It's been on the block about six times. Oh, no, I'm not losing my nerve. I just wanted to really slip, that's all. You don't want to get caught. Oh, you won't get caught. Let's quit stalling. I'll walk through the alley and go into the back exit. All right. Okay. You go to the Chivo Hotel. If everything goes all right, I'll meet you at your car in front of them in half an hour. Be careful, Jim. Good luck. I'll see you in half an hour. Okay. Chivo Hotel. So long.
Superior Court Judge William C. Doran pronounces their sentence. I have a certain sympathy for these offenders, but I have a greater sympathy for the thousands of others who are just approaching the borderline of crime and are likely to step across unless deterred by ad- adequate law enforcement regulations. I think that the court's first duty is to the state. And I have always thought that the probation law contends that probation shall be an exception and not a rule. Therefore, it will be the judgment of the court that for the offense to which you have been found guilty, to which grand test, you will be confined in the state prison of San Quentin for the term prescribed by law. Thus, by a strange twist of human nature, what might have been a tragic, tragic case of false arrest and imprisonment exposed itself because of the man's temper. And because James Hill mentioned that one word, robbery, he sent himself, as well as his accomplices, to prison to pay for their unhappy experience with crime as a business. Thank you, Chief Davis. <laughs> to the studio tonight, I stopped at my Rio Grande service station, and my Rio Grande dealer gave me the new April issue of the Calling All Cars News. There's an unusual detective story of the Peg Leg Terror, an exclusive personal story from Jimmy Cagney, a new crime mystery. It's a very interesting, and your free copy is available at any Rio Grande station. When you buy Rio Grande gasoline, don't fail to specify Sinclair motor oil, either Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline. Refined from the highest priced crude oils in America. They are de waxed, de jellied, and sealed in tamper proof cans. Thin curl oils are used in 45 countries of the world by 150 railroads, by major airlines, and by every type of industry. They are the finest motor oils you can buy for your car. Get police car performance with Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Perfect motor lubrication with thin motor oil. And interesting reading from Calling All Cars News. Be your independent Rio Grande dealer tomorrow. I'll come to the police calling all cars, attention all cars. A cancellation broadcast 175 regarding a robbery. Suspects in this case are now in custody. And that's all. Rose and Pussy. Narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night. <laughs>